year 14 year old most. man <laughs> most of, of his co career mm. at least and right now <coughs> we are organizing a researcher school and such events in order to introduce in France the science of sustainability and so I think we we'll talk about that today and uh, so it is my great pleasure to Thank you. Merci Nathalie, thank you for coming. Uh, yes, I want to go through a couple of points which are a little bit personal, some of them, and others are more related to the history of the IPCC and the birth or emergence of sustainability science, if you will. And, well, I don't go all through, my, through all my points, but this is the list, so let me start um, from the early days of my career, if I, if I may say so. Um, <clears throat> the situation was like this. I lived in northern Germany and uh, it was the 70s and we saw a lot of impact of air pollution on our, on our forest, it was a forested area. And one thing that I didn't find a picture of but that I, I'm still looking and one day I will find is that, well this was, as I said, early 70s and people were asked to come out into the forest, ordinary people, and be informed about forest dieback, about air pollution and forest dieback, but not by some radical leftish uh, uh, green uh, young people or something like that, but by very established forest um, officials with uniforms, and, and, but they were essentially telling us that the government, uh, due to its inaction, was destroying our forests. And that was quite strange because this was shortly after 1968, and in 1968, uh, you may not remember, but you may know from the history books, it was the students who were on the street and they had long hair and they were absolutely not looking like the government and it was basically a protest against the government. Here, it was a protest of the forest, forestry officials, often even civil servants, against the government. And so the forest was dying in, in uh, large areas of, of Central Europe due to acid rain. And the question is, what did the scientists do? And one of them that I would like to cite here is, uh, but one out of many, but the most prominent at the time was Bernhard Ulrich, a professor of soil science in, at Göttingen University, who was also one of the early people who stood up and, and told everyone, look, if we continue with the environmental degradation that we have right now, uh, it's going to be a disaster for Germany and Europe and the world. And this was also quite strange that a, a professor of a university with title and publications and everything that he was saying sh such things. In those days, you were not supposed, so as a professor, you were not supposed to criticize the government or anything. And another person who influenced me, who impressed me at the time, was a climatologist, Hermann Flohn, who basically uh, gave, a, he just gave one talk at the university where I was, and it was about this paper, which had appeared in 1978 and was essentially saying that, first of all, there is climate change uh, provoked by human action, which was in the 1970s absolutely not standard uh, material that people were believing in. And secondly, that this climate change was at risk to destabilize the West Antarctic ice sheet to the degree that within a couple of decades or maybe centuries, but not much longer, we might have sea level rise at the planetary scale all over the planet by more than 50 meters. And you can imagine that, you know, you don't, I don't need to talk much about what 50 meters sea level rise means, but this, is, this was for me a turning point, hearing this talk by Hermann Flohn about this paper by Mercer uh, that was speaking about this, and I looked around the room, you know, there were, here we are only two, but there, there were several of our senior professors there in the room, and I, I wondered, what, do, what are they thinking about that? And basically, uh, they were saying science fiction, uh, alarmism, we don't believe any of that. These are models anyway, we don't believe in models. So uh, I, I was beginning to have some doubts in, in the capacity of science, uh, scientists to, to react to these things. But nevertheless, the, the concern for environmental issues and for development issues began to be a global phenomenon in the 1970s and 1980s. And already in 1968, actually, the General Assembly of the United Nations had taken a decision that it needed to deal, uh, to, to deal with these issues, <coughs> and that it was asking for its next session, the 23rd, to have an item on the agenda that was called the problems of human environment, 1968. 
so even before uh, this Antarctic case that I was just talking about. <coughs> that was quite remarkable at the time, and it led to an event in Stockholm in 1972, which was the first global conference for the environment, uh, run basically under, human, under United Nations principles with all heads of state present, and, and in a very strong way, the Stockholm Conference 72 was saying we have a global problem with the environment and we need to do something about that. So 72, and in the years after that, uh, a lot of things happened slowly but steadily. And one thing was a, um, a meeting in Austria by uh, a complicated, uh, by a group with a complicated name. This was now already 1985. It was the International Conference of the, on the Assessment of the Role of Carbon Dioxide and Other Greenhouse Gases in Climate Variations and Associated Impacts. So that was a recognition that there clearly was something not just with pollution, uh, but also with the climate that, be, that needed to be dealt with. <coughs> and uh, that, uh, at that meeting, it was decided that there should be an advisory group to the United Nations, uh, which was then called the Advisory Group on Greenhouse Gases. It was only eight people in that group, and, uh, and one of them, I will mention him a little bit more, was uh, a Swedish meteorologist with the name Bert Bolin, because Bert Bolin, yeah, this is the, well, that's the statement that the AGGG made. A complicated statement, but I'm reading it out for you because it is kind of the, if you ask about the birth of the IPCC, this is basically when it was born. The advisory group on greenhouse gases, which met at the WMO, World Meteorological Organization headquarters in Geneva, in 1986, under, of, under chairmanship of Professor Hare, strongly supported the statement emanating from the 1985 Villach conference that the effects of increases in carbon dioxide and other trace gases which cause the greenhouse effect, such as methane, CFCs, and nitrous oxide, could produce increases in global mean temperatures of between, and now hold your breath because these are numbers that you, that, uh, you perhaps didn't realize that they were already referred to in the 1980s, between 1.5 and 4.5 degrees centigrade by the end of the first half of the next century, so by 2050. Um, <coughs> when the corresponding rise in sea level, largely because of the expansion of ocean water, might reach between 20 and 100, 140 centimeters. So in 1985, this group of eight people basically knew what we are still trying to have lessons with Emmanuel Macron and everyone else about and basically teach them. You know, the, and, and there's even a request now from governments that, that scientists should actually do training sessions with officials to tell them something that was known in 1985. Now, so that led to um, a, a, an, an international need and, and uh, desire, but uh, in particular organized by the United States under the Reagan administration, to uh, have a more organized, regular, not regulatory, but uh, advisory body for the United Nations about these environmental changes. And the interesting case about the Reagan administration, which was of course not a pro-environment um, uh, president, is that they said, we are worried about the fact that these scientists are all sp speaking to the United Nations in some kind of uncontrolled way. They tell them things, you know, they make advisory groups and stuff, and, and we don't really know what's going on there, so we want, to be, want this to be very organized. And uh, in a way, you could say that was not such a bad idea. Be at least I would say it, it was a good idea, because out of that came the idea that the, that the IPCC would be established as an organization that, you, that not only uh, uses scientific information to advise governments, but also to channel that information in a kind of orderly structure where uh, a clear exchange with government officials is taking place. So the I IPC was born in 1988, and it was not, uh, yes? I, th I think it was a good idea from my perspective, and I think, uh, I think US, um, uh, the US government got something that was much more powerful than they were expecting. They were thinking that they could constrain the process. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what they were really thinking. I wasn't there, but I, I imagine they were thinking that. But I think out of that came uh, the first like, organized science policy interface, which I argue uh, has quite some 
some influence because of the way <coughs> it's being managed by the United Nations. And I, I, I want to talk a little bit about how it is organized. And this caricature is actually not how it is organized. This is what most people on the streets think, that governments are thinking in short-term uh, election cycles and, and scientists are sitting in their laboratories and drawing curves and that they're not talking to each other. And actually, the, the, the IPCC is to a large degree the opposite of what this caricature says. Just on the structure, this is um, uh, not so very interesting, but what, what is really important up here is there are two United Nations organizations, the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Programme, which both have membership of all governments of the, of the planet. And they, together, they come together in something that's called the IPCC Plenary, which is basically a big room in which de delegations from all uh, international, all, all the world's governments come together and they discuss and they decide what they want, to, how they want to use and how they, they want to acquire the, the, uh, the, 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 the state of the art, learn about the state of the art in science about the climate problem. <coughs> and then there's a, there are various structures with the bureau and this executive com committee. What is really important is that the authors, <coughs> people like me, we are, we are down here and we do the work but, it is, uh, but the members of the plenary are the governments, and that's, that's really quite important. It's not that we do what they say. Uh, we are independent because we are not actually paid by this process. We are paid by our respective institutions, in my case by the CNS in France. <coughs> but um, our work is in response to their questions. And as you will see, well, I, 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 will, talk, I will talk through the flow of uh, of, of the work in, 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 a, in a moment, uh, as it has been done from almost the first report onwards. There's this diagram, but I'm going to, I'm going to zoom. Because you're sitting so far away, I'm going to zoom into, uh, for you a little bit more into this. <coughs> uh, essentially, the work starts with, with uh, a scoping process where there's a, a scientist meeting and where we sit together and we say, OK, we could do a report about this and that. These would be really big and interesting issues. And uh, we make an outline and uh, just a rough outline. And then <coughs> we ask the governments, is this what you want? And this is uh, what's called the approval of the outline. Approval means also that the governments may say, well, we want a little bit more of this or a little bit less of that. Uh, that's totally possible, but uh, it's a discussion between the scientists and the, and the governments. And at one point, there's the approval of the outline by consensus. So there's, um, there's a meeting where every country on the planet, including oil producing countries and including uh, small island states in the Pacific and what have you, have agreed, we ask scientists to produce this knowledge. And really, it's, it's, it sounds trivial, but it's a political um, a turning point when they do that, because when you ask for something, and basically, in order to be credible, you also are going to listen to it when it comes back. And I, I'll come back to that later. After that is a process where no authors are nominated, all governments propose authors, and the IPCC Bureau makes a selection, which has the purpose of uh, not only having, uh, in quotation marks, the best authors, but also having <coughs> a good mix of authors from the global north, from the global south, of men and women, of people from different uh, disciplines, of minorities even to a, to, to a degree, um, so there's, there's, the selection process, you may say, is to a certain degree political because it optimizes these factors, but it also is scientific because without uh, a full scientific credibility on the topics that you're going to write about, you're not actually ever going to be uh, nominated for the process. So the selection of authors, <coughs> and then authors sit together and they write a first draft, a first order draft, which they present for review by, by colleagues who are not authors, but who are also scientists. And, uh, and then they make a second dra draft of it, or we make a second draft of it, and that's pre being presented to government representatives. And governments can say, well, uh, this sounds all very nice, but you didn't act all talk about this or that. Or they may say, uh, did you really into, take into account all the available knowledge about this or that phenomenon? <coughs> and, uh, and, and really uh, crucial, uh, with all these review steps, what they do is they send us all their comments in written form in a big Excel sheet, and uh, we have to respond to them, but 
their questions and our comments are going to be published later on. So in other words, if a government says, uh, well, we don't believe any of that, we think climate change is nonsense, then we are explaining uh, in polite terms why climate change is not nonsense and it's going to be published. So for, uh, for those governments who actually do that, it's actually more an embarrassment later on uh, than it is an advantage. <coughs> That's the review process and then there's a final draft and the final draft includes one element that we call the SPM in, in short uh, hand and that basically means the summary for policymakers, which is the shortest possible synthesis of the material that we have assembled, assembled. And that SPM is again reviewed by governments and there's and the whole panel, yes? We do. That's actually, it's a subset of us authors. Uh, we, uh, it's, it's only scientists. Okay. It's not the government <laughs> at all. So it's a summary of each paper or of the report as a whole? No, it's, a, it's, a, it's the shortest possible. You know, the report, the, the, the previous one had about three and a half thousand pages. So it's, a, it's a boiling down from the 3,000 to, to 30 pages. The, what we consider are the absolute essentials of the, of the report, which is incredibly difficult. And, and already between the authors, you fight basically for every sentence, for every comma. And we have had many meetings where we say, yeah, but we need maybe make it a little longer and, and get a little bit more material in there. And then our, our co-chairs who are scientists like us, they say, no, 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 it should be short for the government. So it's a, it's a process that you can, can imagine, but it's only among scientists. And when it's, once it is done, once that summary for policymaker exists, we go to this big meeting um, where all the government representatives are. And often they are actually, although not really from directly from the field, but they are briefed by their governments. The governments want certain things uh, from this report and they also want, uh, including Let's be honest about that. Uh, some governments will not want to see certain things in the report. And uh, the point is that at that stage, when the uh, approval process goes on, the discussion is actually between government representatives. It's not so much between us and them. I mean, we are being asked questions. We show our illustrations and they can ask us technical questions like, why do we have this? And did you take into account that? And and uh, why is this sentence so difficult to understand? And sometimes they say, okay, maybe we can change the sentence a little bit if that works better for you. So we actually do change things. But on substance, um, we, uh, we do not change things because we have analyzed the literature and we, 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 see, we normally see no reason to actually change the substance. And then some governments say, but yes, this is all blah, blah. We don't believe any of that. And then the other governments basically and I always cite the small island states as examples, but it could also be France or Germany or uh, UK could say, no, 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 we have also looked at this and this is completely true what they say. So it's a, it's a debate between governments. And at the la on the last day of the meeting, uh, there's one key moment where the chairman says, okay, are there any more questions to these 30 pages of summary for policymakers? And, uh, and when no country representative uh, raises his hands or her, her hands anymore at that point, then there's a consensus. And that means that the summary, that when you now go to the internet and you download the summary for policymakers for any, from any IPCC report, you have a document that is a scientific document written by scientists, but it's approved by all our governments. And that's, that's really often under, underestimated in the public debate because, you know, you may, have, you may then meet politicians uh, who say, well, this is all blah, blah, and, uh, modeling and IPCC, and we don't believe any of that. But then you, you just have to say, well, you already had your chance to ask all possible questions about that. And your representative at the end of the process said, okay, now there are no longer any questions. We, we approve it. So um, there you, as a government, you really cannot step back from it. And that's basically the, the, the heart and soul of a, of a science policy interface. And that's why, the, that's why actually this whole effort is worth doing because if, if you wouldn't go for the approval process in the end, then we could just write a report. And we do, of course, but it would not have a, 
have the United Nations organized government approval in it. So that's why, that's why uh, I think it's a, it's a powerful um, uh, tool and, and it works quite well. <coughs> and then it's published and it's online and it's uh, freely available and whatever and there are translations into different languages and so on. <coughs> Perhaps just, um, yeah, just a, an image from... Yes, yes. Everything that is written in the IPCC report has to be approved by the government. And in that case, maybe what is written in the IPCC report is um, kind of the, uh, maybe, like the knowledge that we can all agree on. Mm -hmm. but maybe it somehow also is leaving out some knowledge about climate change that is not. Yes. Uh, yes, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> it is clear that if you have uh, issues where there is great, great scientific uncertainty, then first of all what the report needs to do is to say that there is this uncertainty. That's, a, that's, a, that's the first thing to do and often actually we are accused for not speaking enough about uncertainty but if you open the report you realize there's, there's even a code, you know, there's uh, what's called this uh, calibrated uncertainty language and for every single statement we say if we are very certain about that or not so certain and, and sometimes the whole debate is not about the statement but about the level of certainty uh, around it. Um, that's only a part of, of, of the answer to your question but uh, if something is really contentious, for example, if we come back to the uh, Antarctica case, uh, we do not actually know scientifically if uh, West Antarctica is going to disintegrate in the next couple of decades. We, we, cannot, we cannot really know that. We can only say we have indications that uh, make us not rule out this possibility. And we think that that is such a big risk that we not need to talk about it. It's what we call a low likelihood, high impact phenomenon. And you could then say that um, some scientists may have a different estimate of that likelihood from others because it's not really a hard thing that you can measure in a laboratory. Um, so uh, we, the, 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 the consequence and the implication of your question is that the writing of the IPCC reports has a tendency to insist very much on the uncertainties to make them very clear and when, yeah, and when uncertainty is high then our statement is not going to be very strong. Um, I, th I think that's, that's what, one, what one could say about it. And, and then, of course, there are people among, in the scientific community who will step, step, step back from it and will say, well, yes, actually, I believe, uh, I believe the, the likelihood of this is much higher than what we say here. But it's, it's more a belief thing. And uh, when there's no hard scientific evidence for it, then, of course, you cannot say it. But I will come back to the, to the outlier situations later on. Yes, there's a question. That's a very, very good question um, <clears throat> because, uh, of course, uh, as, as your question implies, there are limits to that. There are, there are limits to the capacity uh, of some communities compared to others uh, to intervene into this process. And it also depends on the representativity uh, regarding their respective governments. Uh, that in some countries, if you, if you like, for example, the Nordic countries in Europe, uh, over the years, they have gotten, well, I'm not going to give uh, uh, a rating here, but I think the, the, the Sami people in, in Norway and, and Sweden and Finland, they, are, they have very uh, rather strong representation at now in government decision making and their concerns are taken into account very well because, because they have the capacity, they have the tools, they have, uh, uh, and they have governments that are actually open for that. They had to fight for that for decades, but they, 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 they got there. And of course, that may not be the case for all 
and that is not it, uh, it is not the case for for all uh, marginalized communities around the world. Yes, yes, you have. A this year 2022 we see that the Trump presidency was between 2016 and 2021 was there a delay in the in the issuance of a new report because of hurdles posed by the Trump presidency or they didn't really block anything I'm not sure I'm, what which presidency do you refer to uh, uh, Trump. Uh, Trump. Trump Trump ah no no well t actually no uh, the the Trump story I think it, in the end, only affect um, the IPCC in so far as the US scientists uh, had much less uh, ability to work hard for, for the IPCC. In terms of the actual decision making, um, there was, I think, I noticed very little impact because, um, because I think, I actually, if you want my honest answer, I think they were just too stupid to even understand what this process was about. And, and, uh, and that's, in a way, I mean, that's why I'm talking about it. It's, it's, it's a relatively complicated process, you know, but when, when Trump was stepping out of the uh, uh, framework con convention on climate change, I will come back to the convention in a moment, uh, he was basically saying things that were factually wrong. He was saying that this is a very constraining agreement and the United States cannot accept that. It's not a constraining agreement at all. It, didn't, it doesn't constrain anyone to anything else than to show how, uh, how large your emissions are. And, and that's not what he referred to. His advisors told him this is a bad agreement, just let's get out of it. So no, I think the IPCC in that uh, strangely was, was not so much affected. The US scientists were. To a degree, yes, that's that's uh, that's a fact. Well, I just show you this image from from one of the plenaries. Um, <clears throat> so you sit in in the room, and it's 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 of course even in that room, uh, many of the of the big countries uh, are managing to impose this, themselves stronger on the discussion than 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 others are. But it's an attempt. It's like any UN. Uh, or other international negotiation. I mean, there are rules, you know, there, there, are, there are ways to ask for the floor and, and so on. So there's, it's not perfect, but it's, it's it, as for me as a scientist who's not uh, into politics and diplom diplomacy at all, it was, it's quite amazing to see how this works. And interestingly, the last few uh, approval sessions that we had were fully online um, by, uh, over Zoom, a secured Zoom platform. And they were actually, in a way, even more equitable to a certain degree because there, if you hit the button and you want the floor, you're actually going to get the floor because it's be seen. And if even if your voice is not very strong and your English is not very good, um, you at the when, at the point when you get the floor, you're on everybody's screen and you're actually able to speak. So to some extent, it wasn't fun to sit two weeks uh, from morning to late evening in front of a screen and do the, the last the last approval process, but it had some advantages uh, as opposed to the other approvals. Um, yes, so what's, uh, just briefly, uh, to get back on the timeline, the first um, reports from the IPCC came out in 1990 already. Uh, that's when I was not involved, uh, it was before my time, but this uh, was already having the three working groups, one what they called at the time the scientific assessment of the physical earth system, one on impacts and one on response strategies. And, uh, and uh, in the first report, while well, uh, I'm already talking too much, that there were some very cautious statements on what is actually believed in terms of uh, certainty uh, on, on climate change being caused by humans and that got stronger and stronger. But, but the essential message <coughs> is also from the first report already in this graph and it corresponds to the, to the uh, citation that I gave you a little moment ago from the advisory group where basically they were saying that uh, two uh, degrees now, that, uh, well, th they were talking about 2050, but now if you go to 2100, then two degrees and something more is a lower estimate and the higher estimate is about six. And this is roughly still where, where we are. So that was already in the, in the sixth assessment report. I want to say a little more, a few more things on the context, the policy context of, the, of this IPCC work, because 
Okay, 72, Stockholm Conference in the 80s, establishment of the advisory group and then the IPCC. And now we jump to 1992, 20 years later, the, con the Rio Conference, when um, essentially uh, it was fully accepted that the climate, uh, climate change is a problem, that something needed to be done about it. And uh, several conventions were, were uh, opened for signature, that's the, the proper topic, because there were the, the, the actual signing and ratifications took, took some time after that. And one of them was the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, 1992 <coughs> uh, for the IPCC, that is like the background document on, on which uh, you work, but it is not the IPCC. It should be uh, very clear that this is a, uh, a convention, a legal document between governments, and the IPCC is a, a science advisory process, and they're not the same thing, they're just interacting very closely. Just briefly, what is the goal of the, or what is the key uh, objective of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. <coughs> well, the ultimate objective of it and uh, of any related in instruments uh, that the uh, Conference of Parties may adopt is to achieve stabilization of greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic uh, interference with the climate system. Easy to say. The question is what is a dangerous anthropogenic interference. And there are three um, clarifications in the second sentence, which I think are often forgotten, but they are, they are important to remember. The first is, we don't give you a temperature because we don't know yet in 1992 what a, danger, what, a, what a safe temperature level would be, but we certainly want that temperature evolution to be such that ecosystems can adapt naturally to climate change, nothing more than that. For example, if it gets so hot that that coral reefs are just disappearing, then clearly they cannot actually adapt anymore. Also, we want to ensure that food production is not threatened. So we don't want to be in the range of, of, of climate change where uh, agricultural production is going down. And we want to make sure that economic development can proceed in a sustainable manner. That's, of course, very general terms. But it's interesting that the UNFCCCC is defined by the outcome and not by a temperature level. And that's quite important to remember. Then one thing that the UNFCCC does is has conferences of the parties every year. The first one took place in Berlin in 1995. Uh, actually, the chairman of, the, of that conference was the then environment minister in Germany. It's usually the environment minister. That, uh, the name of that environment minister was Angela Merkel, who later only became chancellor. Um, and already in, in 1995, they said, oh, well, we need a protocol, we need something more clear that, that uh, tells us how we are going to achieve this, this uh, stabilization of the climate. And out of that came the Kyoto Protocol, which was ratified in, or signed, uh, open for ratification in 1997 in Kyoto. And I jump there uh, to, to, uh, to uh, 2015. You see, there's uh, one conference every year, uh, which was here in Paris, the, the, the COP21, where the so-called Paris Agreement was signed. And the, the next one is going to be in a few weeks in Egypt, in Sharm el-Sheikh. And uh, this is just a list of the different reports, but uh, as I said, the 1990 was the first assessment report, 95 the second, 2001 the third, 2007 the fourth, 2014 the fifth, and the sixth was this year and last year. But between those were special reports on special things. Particularly of um, uh, importance is the special report on uh, 1.5, which was specifically requested by governments at the time of the Paris Agreement. They said, OK, now we have this agreement. We say that we want temperatures to stay below 2 degrees. We don't want uh, ideally at 1.5. Now, IPCC, can you please tell us what that means and if it's actually possible? Now is a little break, a breaking point here in the story, because this, is, this was IPCC and climate and the policy context, but there's a different policy context, also ongoing since the 1980s, that we cannot completely leave out of the picture, and that's the uh, context of development, of global development in, in, in all uh, possible ways. And I also make this, I actually make this extremely short in, in just two general slides. Uh, one was the publication in 1987 of the, of the report by the Brundtland Commission, 
Brundtland was the, the Norwegian prime minister in, in those days, Guru Harlem Brundtland, and it was uh, a landmark report because it uh, stated for the first time in, in clear terms, uh, or it gave one definition, let's put it this, that way, it's not the only possible definition, but it gave one de definition of what sustainable development is, and that is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Of course, there were long debates about that. It was also uh, with international participation. It was not just uh, some, some authors, but it was a poli political process. But this was a compromise a definition on, of sustainable development. And we don't need to go into the depth of it right now, but it's, it's uh, one possible way to define the problem. And if I make a fast forward also to 2015, what is, you <coughs> if you will, an outcome of all international gov um, uh, policy <coughs> debate on sustainable development between 1987 and 2015 is what we call the Sustainable Development Goals. Essentially 17 goals <coughs> that are um, describing what is an acceptable human livelihood or should be on this planet. And actually behind each of these goals there are uh, a number of quantifiable targets, <coughs> like so many children in school and, and, and various phenomena, <coughs> very, various quantifiable targets. And all of this negotiated through an international uh, policy process so that I would say it's a fair description of what sustainability and acceptable human livelihoods on the planet can mean. You could have a whole course, and there are whole courses uh, given about that, both about the details of this and also about the shortcomings of the process. Let's just, for the, for the purpose of today's talk, uh, accept that the sustainable development goals are one way to say what this sustainability actually should be. I will, um, I'm already talking uh, uh, too much, but let me just make a few statements on the biosphere, partly because it's what I'm most interested in, but also because there are separate processes that are, yes? No, 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 they're for the entire planet. They're absolutely for the entire planet, but there are now, um, uh, uh, studies um, ongoing and you find many publications about that what wh where we are with respect to the different targets in different parts of the world yes um, <coughs> the biosphere is of course not just something that's nice to have but it's um, it's it's something that's essential for human life I don't need to talk uh, to convince you about that so in the early 2000s there was a process that was independent of the United Nations the United Nations asked for it, but it was not managed by the United Nations, which was called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which had the goal to create a mechanism to increase the amount, quality and credibility of, of policy-relevant scientific research findings concerning both, not just ecosystems, but ecosystems and human well-being to be used by decision makers and particularly those involved in the ecosystem-related conventions, because there's, for example, the Convention for Biodiversity. And <coughs> the um, Millennium Assessment was based on a conceptual diagram, on a, on a fundamental concept on how ecosystem change and what we call the services provided by ecosystems, how they affect human well-being. I think there's a separate lecture in this series about ecosystem services. I've forgotten by, by whom, but so I will not, I will not uh, go deeper into this, but what I want to to, sh to say is that this process was there. It was not the IPCC, but it was inspired by the IPCC to a certain degree. And uh, it allowed us, um, or them, or well, I was part of it, uh, to look at different scenarios and, for example, estimate in 2050 the number of uh, undernourished children under different development scenarios. I, I don't have the time to talk you th through the technicalities of that. But uh, it was clear that f uh, food production is increasing, but uh, and that for several scenarios uh, compared to current level, they were assuming that child malnutrition would actually decrease, but in one of the scenarios it would increase. So that was um, that was a totally different way. That wasn't looking at climate, although climate was 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 playing a role as well. Uh, but it was a precursor of something that then uh, came around, and that is another IPCC-like process 
a process uh, called IPBES, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, established in 2010. And uh, what they did essentially is uh, to have a whole mechanism like the IPCC, but on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And they have produced a number of reports that you can also download from the IPBS website. Don't need to talk about that. And there is now a cooperative um, organization betwe uh, between IPCC and IPBES uh, for uh, coming closer together. And there, there's, we, if you want, we can talk about that later, but I just don't want to go over this without having mentioned it. <coughs> um, so, and uh, IPBES does the same sort of plenary situation like, uh, like the IPCC does. Briefly, um, wh what's new in, in the sixth assessment report? at least in the part that I, I was involved in. I will make this really short. Uh, as I mentioned, there are, there are three uh, major parts of it. Uh, there's the physics of the climate system, there's the impacts and adaptation and vulnerability part, and there's the response uh, part, <coughs> working one, two, and three. And, and uh, I just picked a few slides from, yeah, this, this is where you see them. Just picked a few slides from my standard presentation about that last report. Um, <coughs> on, on from working group two, uh, just to uh, fill a little bit with life what I said earlier on, uh, there were um, really quite a number of authors, 270 authors from 67 countries, 43% uh, of them from developing countries, 41% uh, of them, of all of them uh, women. Uh, there were also 675 authors who were just making small contributions. Uh, we analyzed 34,000 scientific papers, um, which are all listed in the, in the reference list. And coming back to the government and expert review comments that I mentioned earlier, we received in total 62,418 comments by governments and experts on anything that was written. And we have responded to every single one of them. And you can actually look at it if you if you want, if you care to download that, that Excel sheet and you can actually ask, for example, what did my government ask in terms of questions to, this, to the earlier drafts of this report? Uh, one study that, I, that I, I, I was quite interested in um, that we cited was this one and it was a study that um, used machine learning tools in order to find what does the scientific liter literature tell us about actually already occurred impacts of climate change on the planet and so this computer algorithm and that it's I, this is not uh, not nonsense as me put it this way i think this is a, uh, this is a quite a good study they found uh, more than 77000 studies papers scientific papers that all showed some impact of climate change somewhere on the planet but of course they're not evenly distributed there are much more studies in europe and north america also a lot in china now in india and in Australia, and there are of course other parts like Africa where there are fewer studies, but it's still a sea change compared with earlier assessments where we had basically no knowledge from places like Central Africa or, 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 or Northern Asia or some, some other regions. So although this looks like a terrible, un terribly uneven distribution, it's actually much better than it used to be. And then just for you as a, um, Mm, I'm not going to explain any of these dots. What I w uh, why I'm showing this table is that the, the whole report is full of tables like this where you can go in and you can say, okay, I'm interested in ecosystems and human systems um, uh, or in, in ecosystems and maybe in ecosystem structure and, and this or that region. Then I find the dot there and if I uh, look at the underlying tables, I find information, precise information about that region and that sector. And that the same is the case for human systems organized in different, uh, different categories like health, like cities, uh, infrastructure, uh, all these things. So the IPCC is not just the standard um, summary statements that you get. It's actually an encyclopedia of impacts and vulnerabilities from around the planet and it should be used that way. <coughs> Nevertheless, there are some, some uh, really overarching key statements. One is that about 3.3 to 3.6 billion people now live in hotspots of high vulnerability to climate change, which means in places that are at risk during the coming few decades 
either by a sea level rise or by a drought or by other extreme events. And, and that's, a, that's, of course, a substantial and a very important number. <coughs> Um, and they are not, not there, there are also maps about this, which regions are more at risk than others, but it's also important to, or, to be aware that even in rich countries where there's correspondingly few uh, people at direct risk from climate change, there are always the disfavored pop populations who are nevertheless more at risk than, than, than I am, for example, in a well-insulated house. <coughs> And then uh, there's, of course, uh, the discussion on this is not IPCC, but uh, the direct impacts of extreme events where there's a lot more, uh, in particular the heat waves, uh, a lot more concrete information now uh, than there was in previous reports, even though the temperature may be still be, the temperature curve may be the same, but we know much more on potential impacts on, on humans than we used to do. And there's much more regional detail. The, the, this, you, you cannot see this from the back, but this is basically an assessment of drought risk around the planet, and it's a tile resolution. You can zoom in there. There's a whole atlas, a, uh, a digital atlas associated with it, and it gives you for every spot on the planet essentially a fair estimate for different scenarios about drought risks. And there are, and there are assessments of biodiversity risks which uh, that are also now highly regionalized. One thing that uh, IPCC has developed over, over the different reports are these what we call burning embers, which are bars which um, for different systems uh, show along the temperature scale, you know, here's, here is uh, two degrees, for example, whether we are going to, whether we are at, lis at risk to lose those, those systems or not. Um, <coughs> Again, uh, take some time to, uh, to get used to them, but what is really interesting is the comparison between the fifth and the sixth assessment report with regard to the same bars, where uh, we can see that in the fifth assessment report there was much more yellow, in other words, much less risk identified for some of these than there was in the sixth assessment. So in other words, um, the, uh, not only the regional knowledge and detail is increasing, but also the risks themselves are, uh, are emerging much stronger than they, than they used to do. Just a few words on adaptation. Action on adaptation has increased, but progress is uneven and we are not adapting fast enough. And, uh, and of course, why is that? It's, it's in part because there's still uh, unsustainable use of natural resources, there's still habitat destruction, uh, there's still, uh, of course, uh, urbanization, which is uh, poorly planned, and there's inequity around the world. And all these factors are not climate, but they are, they are increasing, uh, or they're, they're making it more complicated, and more costly, and often uh, simply impossible to, to adapt to, to climate change. <coughs> the two areas where we uh, see uh, um, the strongest indications of potential adaptation to be successful, but need also be, be uh, strengthened. One is in food security, where the really the shortest possible message is that the arrival of agroecological methods that would be a separate talk, and I think maybe you're even going to have one in the series, um, <coughs> is going to help a lot in the food system to, to adapt. It's not just like eating less meat, although that also plays a role, uh, but it's really a, a question of how much do you use mineral fertilizers, how much do you recycle the carbon and nutrients within, within the farm or within a given region, all these factors of agro agroecology. And the other area where um, uh, su um, significant adaptation options are is in urban development, uh, where basically we know that mo having more urban green spaces, that planning uh, cities for less uh, or no car traffic and for any other factors are going to not only increase uh, livelihoods, improve livelihoods of people, but making, are going to make cities more sustainable. The limits to adaptation are, are very clear and, and perhaps the most important one is that uh, the current estimate is that by globally, by two degrees, if we reach two degrees, then it will be challenging to farm multiple stable crops in many current growing areas. And it's very, you could say it's a very state, uh, vague statement, it doesn't speak about rice or, or, or wheat or what, what, what it is, but it's really 
the generalization of something that we observe already now, that in some areas because of drought, because of lacking access of, um, of irrigation water for, for other reasons, it may be difficult to farm the same crops as we do at the moment. And, uh, and this is what we call the hard limits to adaptation. Another hard limit to adaptation is if you do have a lot of sea level rise, because that will, for example, hit coastal agriculture and areas such as the Mediterranean. And one thing that's going to be very high on the agenda for the COP27 um, in, in Egypt uh, in two weeks from now is the financial constraints. Is that, uh, yes, you can adapt, but you actually need to have money for it. And the, the, the fundamental idea is that, of course, if you are in the South and you live uh, the consequences of the global north uh, uh, emissions, then you need to be compensated for that. And even earlier promises for that have not been kept by, by northern governments. All this leads us to something we call climate resilient development. And, uh, and, and let me leave the keyword uh, with, with you there and let me now jump to this last uh, piece, and I come back to it, um, of, the, of the talk, which is about the emergence of sustainability science. Because sustainability science, in one way, you could define it as the science to achieve global sustainability. Now, a, sh a um, little jump into history that may surprise you. <coughs> there was a German uh, forester in Saxony, <coughs> Hans Karl von Karlowitz, who in the 18th century uh, was writing uh, his lifetime achievement, his, his book about forestry. And he is often uh, quoted as the person who actually invented sustainability. Because essentially what he says in the book, and I only, it was, it's so hard to translate this old German in, in proper English that I didn't want to put it on the slide, but I'm going to tell you what, what, what it basically says. <coughs> it says that if you, uh, you should use the greatest art and science and effort um, and infrastructure really um, to uh, conserve uh, the, uh, the production of wood in such a way that you can continuously benefit from it. You know, the continuierliche beständige nachhaltende Nutzung. So if you use more wood essentially than you grow, then you're making a big mistake. Weil es eine unentbehrliche Sache ist, because you cannot actually live without it. And without it you can't even make food, because if you, if you uh, in, at least in Central Europe, if you don't have wood to, to cook or to heat yourself or anything else, so that was really the, the, the first time that somebody wrote down that sustainability is a concept that um, goes also beyond generations. It is not in this, in this particular sentence, but in forestry it's quite obvious that you, you, the trees that you plant, you're not actually planting them for yourself, you're planting them for your children. Or if you cut the whole forest that you had, then your children are not going to have uh, any, any resources when, once, once you're gone. Now that is kind of the history, uh, the, or the, uh, the earliest mentioning of, of sustainability. And you could say it comes back on and off, particularly in forestry, but didn't really have much mileage and much visibility before around the year 2000. And this was in part because of all the things that I told you so far, uh, because of the global situation that uh, people were beginning to realize that we are in an unsustainable situation with with uh, in regarding our resource use. So around the year 2000, this is a paper from 2003. It's not the only one. It's not even the best one. I'm, uh, you, you, can, you can find uh, different, different papers from that time. Uh, but Bill Clark and uh, Nancy Dixon wrote Sustainability Science, the emerging research program. They just noticed that more and more in more and more places around the world, people are interested in what this sustainability means. And they defined it. Uh, sustainability science focuses on the dynamic interactions between nature and society. Full stop. Very simple. No philosophy, no theory, no nothing behind that. It's, it's, a, it's a recognition that if we don't manage our natural resources in some, some reasonable way, then society is going to suffer with the consequences of it. I want to, at this point, make a step uh, slightly uh, back. Um, 
uh, yeah, no, okay, the, 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 that's, that's another uh, state, statement out of this paper. Sustainability science is not yet an autonomous field or discipline. It's rather a vibrant air arena that is bringing together scholarship and practice, global and local perspectives from north and south, um, and disciplines across the natural and social sciences, engineering and medicine. Uh, so you could say, oh, well, it's just a mixed bag, and so everything, and, and uh, I'm quite anxious to um, allow that, if you will. I sometimes meet people uh, in, in, in meetings now um, where I talk about sustainability science where they say yes, but you must uh, be aware of what the philosophy of it is and the theory and you cannot just mix a whole lot of theories together and I, I'm happy with all, with all that. But the, the, the main point is that this should not be an exclusive shop of some very smart theoreticians of, of science, this should really, that's why I like this, this uh, slightly American expression there of a vibrant arena um, where you can really do a lot of things as long as you are interested in this relationship between nature and society. But just to bring it a little bit, uh, make it a little bit more robust, this is a work by uh, a person called John Schellner who has been influencing me very much because I, I've worked with him since the 1990s. Um, and he was not actually using uh, sustainability science in this paper, but he was talking about earth system analysis and that what we are actually heading for is a second Copernican revolution. And I can't give you full, uh, make uh, give full justice to this paper. I invite you to read it. It's short. It's, it's, uh, it's quite entertaining actually, but it, he's basically making the statement that from uh, having looked at the planet in the Renaissance in, uh, during the Enlightenment, we have come a, a, a big step forward to, to uh, have what we call a macroscope. We are not only just looking at little things, we are looking at the entire planet. We are looking at it like a, like a doctor is looking at your body. We are looking at ocean currents, for example. Um, and we are, we are trying to understand the whole meaning of it. We are not just interested in, the, in something that oscillates a little bit. We are interested in, in the whole organism, if you will, which is, it could be the Earth system. And he comes up with, th with three very simple questions, which could be guiding for sustainability science. He says, we are un we're confronted ultimately with a control problem. A geo task, it can be summed up in three fundamental questions. First, what, what kind of world do we have? Second, what kind of world do we want? And third, what must we do to get there? And this third one is, I'm not going to say very much about it, but I'd like, to, I'd like you to keep it in mind because the way we are with our modest means at the moment trying to relaunch sustainability science in France and elsewhere is very much about that. Is it's very nice to understand all these things, but we actually have to have an impact on policy. And that's why this also connects to to the policy processes that I had in the first, uh, first part of the talk. The implementation of um, Schellenhuber's challenge and those of others in those days was to look at what he calls the planetary machinery, which is um, a, a totally, if you will, physical and biological way of looking at the planet. You can't see any of, of the details here, but it's about terrestrial ecosystems, marine ecosystems, the climate, clouds, soils, geology, um, <coughs> and, and uh, actually this, this, uh, the origin, origin of this diagram was created on a, on a paper napkin in a, in a restaurant by a guy called Francis Bretherton, but it, uh, nobody has this napkin anymore, but it's, it's, um, uh, it's the famous Bretherton diagram, and here a little bit um, uh, enhanced, but it's looking at the physical and biological earth system and how it works. And it only makes little uh, things here on the side, like human activities here uh, on land use, human activities there on climate change. Uh, so humans are actually outside that. They're not part of it, yes? Has this uh, system that they are being implemented in other circumstances? In many different ways and never perfectly because we are always short of data and short of uh, precise understanding of these processes, but there's a whole category of models that, that are aiming to do that. But the question is then, what do you actually do with it? You know, C Can you actually turn that into a, into a control tool where you, where you uh, uh, turn some buttons and out comes a sustainable earth system? Uh, you of course cannot. It's a, it's a, it's a 
means to, to understand some physical and biological parts of it, but um, you, you, you cannot actually imagine that to, to fully uh, comprehend the Earth system in this way. Nevertheless, what came out of that, not directly of these models, but a, um, uh, was, became a principle of sustainability science were these planetary boundaries where uh, you could say that for certain subsystems like the use of nitrogen or systems change in land use or genetic diversity, this is really just an early version, you find many, many variants of this diagram. You, um, you could notice that even if you quantify, you can do some quantification, but there's, uh, and it allows you at one point to define a limit beyond which the exploitation of these resources is no longer sustainable. And there are many criticisms to this process, and uh, every expert who looks at it from one particular angle says, yes, but you did not actually properly consider this. But it's a, it's a, uh, it's a concept that allows you to begin to discover where are the limits to, uh, to the functioning of the Earth system. And, and the complex models that we have are, to a degree, helping you uh, to identify those limits. What is increasingly becoming, yes? I don't know if I'm interrupting with this, but uh, I'm always wondering why no one is talking about the boundary of like uh, nitrogen and uh, um, in general about this thing when we already like surpassed it so much as you have said. And we're always talking about climate change and biodiversity. But <laughs> oh, yes, it's well, <laughs> it's an interesting question what. Um, what we perceive as nobody is talking about, you know? I mean, uh, for example, I sometimes, uh, when I'm a real climate denialist and they say, oh, nobody's talking about uh, natural variability or something like that, because we, are, we have actually looked at it and we, did, we found it that it's not so important as, as the overall trends, you know, that's the answer to them. But um, for your question about nitrogen and others, I would argue that, yes, we are talking about it. The community is talking about it. And there are uh, groups, uh, big groups even, working on it, but perhaps not with the visibility uh, that you would desire or with sufficient effort or with sufficient resources. Um, and and that is, that, from that comes an important lesson because it means that those kinds of concepts, they are, you could see their role as being to trigger questions and to generate new research uh, into, into various aspects of it and to convince even funding agencies to say, for example, here's on atmospheric aerosols, uh, it's basically gray because there, there's not in sufficient information or well, there was not at the time of when this was drawn. This is actually one of the early versions. And, and for if I'm a funding agency and I'm interested in sustainability science, if I have a political message to, to, to engage in sustainability science, then I can use this diagram to justify new research, uh, new synthesis of existing research in, in this particular sector or in another one. I'm just, I'm just taking it as an example. So I wouldn't say that nobody's talking about nitrogen, but um, maybe not enough. <laughs> and there's a, for example, there's a big, big uh, project uh, about phosphorus, which is in a similar category. Um, and we are still waiting for the main results, you know, but uh, there will be, I think we will see a lot of interesting papers on phosphorus in, in, in the coming years out of that, out of that uh, ERC project. I hope I un understood the, the yes question. Yes? Yeah. So I, I, every time I, I, s I see this graph, yeah, you probably know that there is this economist, Kate Howard, that she kind of took the similar idea for the Don Donald's economics. Yes, yes. And uh, okay, every time I, me as an economist, I want to address ecological issues, I always go back to this mm -hmm. work and her work. Yes. Um, but I always wonder myself, I don't know nothing actually about this work in particular. For example, this one is so complex. Yeah, I, I, <coughs> I try to understand, okay, I'm not an ecologist. Mm -hmm. I, I see all the, the, the nine spheres. That I think it's nine, yeah, they're analyzing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to know uh, your opinion on this. Like, do you think that we are missing 
um, it is a good starting point for someone who is not from natural science to start uh, addressing um, global ecological change based on this work, because this is what we usually do. This is not yes. a bit mainstream yes. ecological. So. <coughs> yes, that's not an easy question to answer. <coughs> I think. I think it depends a little bit on what concrete problem you have in front of yourself. If you are working on truly global issues that, that, that concern the entire planet, then I think this is an entry point. Then you can uh, read the papers, first of all, carefully and, and try and understand what models or other assumptions were used to determine the, the boundaries. and and all of these things, but that will of course take you to a limit only because for if you, if you are actually comparing that to some regional situation, even a large regional situation, you know, I work a lot on the Mediterranean, for the Mediterranean this doesn't tell me anything, yeah. you know, the, for example the water uh, resource problems in the Mediterranean, they are kind of hidden somewhere in there, but, and land system change problems, but they are not actually illustrated by this anymore. This is really the global, uh, the global total, if you will. And, and, um, and so uh, if, if, if you are interested in something else than the global total, then it doesn't going to, it's not going to help you. So would you have um, other suggestions of words that we could use for this? I w yes, yes. And, and um, sorry if it's a little bit... Uh, it's certainly not the only po entry point, but I think the IPCC reports are one entry point, yeah. and the IPBS reports another in a, of a similar uh, scale. But you really need to go beyond the summary for policymakers. You really need to find the chapter, or the, uh, which could be a regional chapter or a sectoral chapter, and then in many cases you will have to look what are the references that are being cited here and how were they constructed. And, and it's, it's frightening because there's so much, <laughs> but, but it's really working like, a, like an encyclopedia. Yes? yes? Uh, just a remark about the freshwater use, because just in this summer we have seen the Rhine River drying up, the same the Colorado River in the United States, we, we have seen droughts in West and East Africa. So why is the freshwater use not so, not as, uh, at an alarming Change. Yes, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question. I don't have the answer to it. It's 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 r certainly an old version of the of the of the diagram, um, but um, freshwater use in this case is I think identified uh, identified as the direct use by people for for drinking and personal consumption and also for agriculture. And, um, and, and uh, that, uh, that looks like an underestimated limit. I think there was a, there was a, a new paper about um, uh, the, the water resource, basically the green uh, uh, water boundary, planetary boundary last year. And that showed a much, that showed we actually passing the boundary for that. The green water is, uh, is the, the water that's actually embedded in the food, uh, food resources, yes. Yes, yes, Natalie has it here, exactly. So I, I, sh I should not show this diagram anymore. Yes, thank you for spotting that. <coughs> but OK, I'm showing it as a, as a way to, to, to come to global averages. But as, as, you, um, as you look into the, well, and, and one thing that also the complex models, even the biophysical models that are behind the Bretherton diagram, that they allow you to do but that we need to become much better of is to look at nonlinear phenomena. Because uh, if you use a little bit more water and a little bit more still, then you, uh, you often come to these breaking points and tipping points. And, and one, one example that, that I, I like very much is that, for example, if you, during a period, uh, this is historical observations, during a period of, of slow climate change, if you put a lot of fresh water into the North Atlantic at one point, uh, you, you get uh, a, a dramatic and fast response of, of the system in terms of sea level, um, uh, where, where before everything was going like quite slowly, but then there was this meltwater pulse, as they call it, basically south of Greenland, and it was triggering a quick change in ocean circulation and in sea level rise, and it was, it's, not, it's much faster than the actual climatic forcing would be looking like. So those tipping points are, 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 are questions that have a regional nature, 
where where something happens locally, but with with global consequences. And and the real um, interest is to understand them a little better. I've already mentioned the the Antarctic. Um, uh, deglaciation is, is one such tipping point that was identified early, but that we that we are beginning to see uh, that it could have major importance. There are also tipping points in the biosphere, where if we have a slow change, for example, in northern ecosystems, uh, in the tundra, we may have sudden releases of of um, uh, methane and and even CO2 from uh, these permafrost areas, and you may also have uh, suddenly an increase in wildfire, as we've seen it in completely natural forests, like we've seen in Siberia, and, and you, it has consequences even in the ocean and with the retreating sea ice. So there is, and you must have heard about that, a global mapping um, uh, interest, mapping project, many projects actually to identify the nonlinear points. And why do I talk about that in the context of sustainability science? It's because of the, if we want to stabilize our system, if, if that's what the, the world that we want, we need to understand these and we need to, uh, to to not just manage climate change, but to manage all factors where we influence the, the environment, so, such as to avoid these uh, major tipping points to be passed, because that would actually take us into uncontrollable uh, terrain. One tipping, one mechanism for, for avoiding tipping points is coming back to the climate case, is to uh, deal with anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions and actually turn the curve. You know, we are still at the moment in increasing, in increasing concentrations, and if we keep con uh, increasing them, then we are going to pass those tipping points. So we will have to have a non-linear behavior in our own economy, and our own resource use, um, because otherwise we will not be able to stabilize anything. So non-linearity is not just something that the physical and biological system exposes, but it's also something that, that hum human the human economy and the human society uh, must deal with. We must come to an understanding of how to initiate processes that take us into new, that take us away from, from basically the linear trends that we all, certainly my generation has, has been, um, is used to now. <coughs> well, let's, let's not, yeah, I think I, I will jump over this. Um, the the IP, IPCC lecture on sustainability, if you will, and uh, the, the request for the underlying science that comes out of this is that we have to consider ecosystems, human society, and climate change in their interactions. That's, if you will, a, uh, a, a simple uh, statement about how to implement Earth system analysis into um, Sustainability science you know, that you have to that those are really the three main uh, three main factors at least from the IPCC perspective we, we need to take into account climate in other words atmosphere and ocean uh, human society including its um, own dynamics and ecosystems including biodiversity and before I talk about the second part I answer your question or try thank you um, so at the beginning you said sorry to this uh, interrelation. There are conflicts. Um, if there are different uh, frameworks, and uh, how are they being dealt? Like, what yes. is the discussion between both uh, both of them? Yes, today? that's an excellent question um, to ask, and we can perhaps um, also come back to it in the discussion. But I try and give you a, a, a brief answer right now. It is clear that from an IPCC perspective, first of all, IPCC established in the 1980s. Uh, IPBES much later, uh, in, in finally in 2010, um, the, the IPCC concern and in a way the biggest political 
battles that the IPCC has and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change have had to fight were with, the, with basically the oil industry, if you will, the oil and gas industry. There was basically uh, the issue was can we limit and modify our consumptive um, uh, economy in such a way that oil and gas use is going to, and coal is going to be reduced. You could say that's kind of the question. It's always in the back when you are the, at the IPCC. For the for IPBES, that's not at all the key question. It's also one question, but for IPBES, the question is how do we use the land and the ocean, and how do we treat the ecosystems in in them? And there, if you say, if, if I simplify it very much, there the the enemy or the 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 forces that you um, that you struggle with are much more in the food production system and the associated industries and it's different countries that have different interests uh, from those that are in, in, in the climate context. That's, uh, that's one main difference. The other difference is historical that since IPBES was d um, developed much later and this comes back to this very early question, um, uh, countries from the global south and particularly some of them with some relatively strong participation of indigenous people uh, have managed to impose themselves a lot stronger in the IPBES um, uh, proceedings and development of the conceptual framework than is the case in the IPCC. And that is be just because uh, the everyone had been observing the development of the IPCC and they have said, well, okay, we want to have this done in a way that our interests are better represented. And you see that in the conceptual framework of, of, uh, of the IPBES, that um, there's, uh, for example, a better recognition of different worldviews. Uh, we are clearly, I'm, I'm clearly standing here with my history as a, as a Western, uh, Northern worldview of uh, fluxes of goods and money. Uh, but there are other worldviews, and maybe you will c uh, are going to speak to them, um, that, are th that are absolutely underrepresented in the IPCC process, but uh, that are better represented in IPES. Yes, your question. Um, yeah, you mentioned when um, there was a particular event in Chile where the um, Chilean uh, and some of the information that we're starting to discover about you know, all the biomass and all that updates to this that we're moving towards um, perhaps reprioritizing, say, the UN priorities that are to less anthropocentric uh, priorities? Because right now, when you look at the priorities, it's still very much anthropocentric. Well, the, the, the difficult word in, your, word in your question is anthropocentric, mm -hmm. um, because um, what I just said before, about local and indigenous people and knowledge and their knowledge is it was not primarily about a, a non-anthropocentric uh, worldview. I, I accept and, and uh, yes indeed in, in IPES there's also the, the, the view um, that there's an intrinsic value to nature that we are just not, we just do not have the right to destroy it even if it doesn't do us any, even if it doesn't deliver us any service, right? Which is, which is kind of what's uh, the debate behind the word anthropocentric. And, uh, and uh, yes, these debates are, or this, this tension is more visible in, in IPES uh, circles and in the reports, indeed. It's also becoming more visible in the IPCC because when, when it says here ecosystems including biodiversity, then uh, this is not from a purely um, uh, productive or consumption-oriented perspective. It's from the perspective of, of uh, ensuring that, uh, that biodiversity actually stays there even if it's not useful. But, I mean, those are general terms when I, when I, when I say them this, uh, like this. The, the concrete debate on certain on specific statements or on specific biomes and specific uh, livelihoods of people is always going to be very complicated and I, I don't think I can, I can do it for, for, for justice. I mean, I personally would uh, like to say that um, I think the, the, the really, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of accepting an anthropocentric worldview in the sense that, that everybody on the planet should have 
decent uh, living in terms of food and shelter and basic needs. Um, and, and in some cases and in some regions, this will not be possible to actually provide without some negative impacts on the ecosystem. On the other hand, if you completely destroy the ecosystem, then in the end, you're not going to have those services either. I think that, yes? Yeah, just a follow-up question, mm -hmm. okay. Um, yes? Uh, are there divergences on policy implications um, between IPVS and IPCC? Like, I, I always kind of think if there are, I don't know, policy f uh, for climate change mitigation that may hinder uh, biodiversity and how, are, how do you deal with this tension? Yes, the tension is absolutely there, but um, it doesn't, well, it, it, would, it would be nice to have uh, uh, some people in the room for a more, uh, for, for a better discussion on how it actually happens on the ground in the IPBES plenaries and in the, also in the IPCC Working Group 3 plenaries. But the part that I did not bring any slides uh, for today, but that, that concerns me very much, is also already hidden in your question, is that some, uh, some of the um, uh, pathways that are currently proposed for sustainability, in other words, for stabilizing the climate, they are assuming they're making huge assumptions on one specific technology, which is called CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, which essentially says that, okay, we need to reduce our emissions, but since we cannot reduce it as much as we need to, why don't we plant a lot more trees, uh, burn those trees for energy and capture the CO2 and put the CO2 underground? Uh, this is what's called CCS, and it's a technology that, in theory, in some small installations has already worked, but that many people, like including myself, uh, question for two main reasons. One is that the stability of those storage facilities are, is very doubtful. First of all, it's limited, but it's also very doubtful that uh, the CO2 will actually stay underground. And the second and the more important, which is in, in your question, is you will need vast amounts of land where you just plant fast growing trees. And we basically have to get rid of all other e ecosystems on it. You know, you just have to do as much as you can with, with fertilizers and pesticides to get those trees grow fast. And, and, uh, and that's not a sustainable perspective on the planet. And you could say there's, um, there's a whole field of research about these things. It's not that it's being ignored. And that also, for me, would qualify as sustainability science. And in a way, I mean, these are generic terms, but the, here on the right-hand side, you, you have what we call climate-resilient uh, development, and it's, it talks about transitions. It talks about ecosystem transitions, talks about uh, de limiting cl uh, global warming, and it talks about human systems transitions. It talks about how to adjust and how to, tr how to transform human society in order to to, uh, to get into climate resilient development. And uh, it's small in small letters here, but it's, it's, it's keys from urgent to timely action. And if you ask me what sustainability scientists do, then it is to support this red arrow or this blue triangle there, is to find ways to, to study anything, uh, societal dynamics or atmospheric or ocean dynamics or ecosystem dynamics or the, the, the connection between those in, in ways that allow us to go from urgent to timely action. And what this needs, and i just give you some, some few examples here of recent studies that do not label themselves as the ultimate answer to all sustainability questions like the, like the Shen paper perhaps did, but that, that tell us essential um, things about not only the functioning of the earth system and human livelihoods, but also our way of dealing with it in processes such as the IPCC. This was a paper that, that caused a lot of uh, noise or a lot of ang angry reaction just a month ago, <coughs> where uh, basically um, a group of uh, very high uh, powered uh, authors got together and said, okay, if we past 1.5 degrees, where are the tipping points that we could actually pass? 
and it's all in, in conditional. We do not know, we don't have a predictive machinery that says exactly when and where. And I'm not going to, to um, uh, talk to you about the results, but it finds that there are a number of systems where with the tipping points, in other words, uh, the, the rapid change of some system that makes it less, also less predictable for the future, um, are a serious possibility. And we are, we are now looking at Sharm el Sheikh and the, uh, the, 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 um, the COP27, and that's basically where, where you would expect the decision to be made that maybe we should uh, enhance our efforts to stay below 1.5. <coughs> So um, the, 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 the view that, uh, that, that you could say or that, that you hear in the media is, you know, our extended forecast includes global warming and the catastrophic end of the human race, but for the weekend it's looking like sunny skies, mild temperatures and general apathy toward environmental constraint, concerns. Um, this is how, it, how this often comes through in the, in the media. <coughs> But the urgency is, if I say that once again, increasing. And um, the IPCC, once again, come back to it, has used the word transition and transformation, or transition in this case, for the first time in the 1.5 degrees report, 2018. It says that um, pathways limiting global warming to 1.5 would uh, need far-reaching transitions in energy, land, and urban infrastructure. And these transitions are unprecedented. So the social challenge, the human and the economic challenge, societal challenge, it boils down to that, that we need to do things that we have actually not done before. And IPES did something similar. It talks about transformative changes. It's actually now preparing an entire report about transformative changes. But uh, they say that goals for conserving and sustainably using nature and achieving sustainability cannot be met by current trajectories and goals for 2030 and beyond, may only be achieved through transformative changes across economic, social, political, and technological factors. And once again, remember what I said before, these are statements approved by governments. They may not actually think this means very much, but if you look at it from a scientific perspective, then, then you, <coughs> you will realize that governments actually signing things that are calling for substantive for substantive uh, transformative change. Um, so, to conclude, uh, come back to uh, coming back to what kind of world do we have? What kind of world do we want? And how do we get there? This is what sustainability science still for me is 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 about, and it, it includes this third issue on on uh, how do we get there? I I was just. Uh, tempted to, to show you this paper, it's only three days old, <laughs> uh, but I, 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 I have not even fully, fully looked at it, but it's one of the things that we need to do. We need to look at the environmental footprint of everything that we do, including global food production. And this, uh, I think, is a, is a brilliant study that is looking at both greenhouse gas consequences of food production, regionalized around the planet, nutrient use, disturbances, uh, water use, the question that's being asked, you know, where you can now see from space that basically uh, India is, is overusing its water resources to a degree which is, uh, which is really frightening, <coughs> and so on. Um, another perspective of this, uh, what is the world that, that we want, and how do we get there, is that you need, we need to consider the worst case scenarios, there has been a tendency, and that is also res in response to one of the questions that was asked, um, the IPCC process of this careful framing um, and, and of the consideration of, of uncertainty brings us often in this, into a situation where the low likelihood, high impact risks are not talked about enough because we, no, we do not have high certainty statements about that. This paper did the opposite. Uh, it was looking at, uh, or it was actually not even, it was looking at different cases, but it was only, it's an opinion paper. It was saying, we need to look much harder at the worst cases. We don't actually do not enough uh, research, research about them. And one thing sustainability scientists in the future should do is, let's, Im let's imagine uh, that Antarctica, West Antarctic ice 
um, uh, disintegration accelerates rapidly. It, we cannot rule it out, we are not sure that it will happen, but what if it does? Uh, for the simple as, as, as that, how would we adapt to that? And there's um, many, vec ma many, many, um, uh, many aspects where we can look at that. But then there's a positive, I think a positive, uh, um, partly positive uh, state uh, paper out of sustainability science, which I also would like to, to illustrate. It talks about social tipping points, and social tipping points in the understanding of these authors is what do you actually need to change in society and in public discourse in order to achieve uh, a broader acceptance of sustainability policies? And, and so, um, for example, in the educational system, it's clear and it's now it's all over the place in, in France and elsewhere that we recognize that the educational system needs to be uh, better prepared to um, inform everyone about those issues that I've been talking about. It's um, uh, in, the, in the IPCC report this is being referred to as climate illiteracy. There are just too many people, even those who are in school today or at universities, who are not fully aware of, of uh, climate and biodiversity issues. And this is something that, that the educational system needs to deal with. And this very course where we are here is, is, uh, is part of that. And basically what, what um, they looked at in this study is that how uh, much time uh, do we need to invest into changing the educational system until a point that it matters for the entire social and political discourse. If you, will. These are, you cannot model that in some hard and physical way, but you can actually uh, use a lot of uh, techniques in order to in order to estimate this. Other, other um, factors are the financial markets where uh, in principle you could uh, inc incite some really rapid changes. Um, <coughs> in, in you could just change some, some of the essential rules and the uh, financial markets would, would uh, react quite quickly in terms of the settlement patterns you, and so on and so on. I'm not, not going to talk you through this, this, uh, this paper, but uh, it's an interesting way of looking at sustainability to ask yourself where, uh, what is my safest assumption on the things that I can actually change from a societal level. We get a lot of talk from uh, policy makers and the industry about the electric car, for example. Like if, as if changing the engine in your car would be a major sustainability issue. It's not completely irrelevant. And I'm not going to talk you through the whole um, story of the electric car, but it's really not a major, it's not an innovation, it's not going to solve the major problems. The major problems are those that are, that are listed on this um, diagram, and they are social, uh, social and economic problems rather than technological problems. So my temporary conclusion here is that there's no such, there's no established theory of sustainability science, and nor should there be. In my view, as my as my personal view, it's a it's a bunch of different approaches to address uh, the, the issues that I've been talking about. <coughs> uh, there should be an openness to a wide range of theories, uh, which means which gives a, a specific meaning to interdisciplinarity. We very often are in situations where we say, "Ah, yes, we want more interdisciplinarity," but well, yes, of course. I mean, but that you need for a lot of for a lot of, for a lot of current issues. Um, what I am a little bit uh, tired of is long and theoretic debates on what exactly interdisciplinarity is and how do you actually do it um, and, and what you should not do and, and how to build this into a complex intellectual building. Some people may want to do that. I'm, I'm, I don't want uh, them to stop it, but basically uh, for me, uh, in, the, in the places where I've worked, I've met physicists and psychologists and economists and anthropo anthropologists and biologists and oceanographers and we basically have looked at the problems together and we have tried to bring our different different um, uh, theories and, and methods to the to the table and what matters in the end are the outcomes for human livelihoods and the survival of, of, of the biosphere and I started with some personal statements I want to end with some as well um, where do I see our 
options as scientists to, to do something at the moment, just some very f f short flashy points. Uh, one thing that I, I find really um, exciting at the moment, uh, this is in French, but um, this is just to illustrate something that at many French universities, both here in Paris, but it's actually started in Toulouse, also where we are in Marseille, there are uh, what, what is called here uh, uh, workshops or, or working groups to, to discuss political ecology. Now, don't get me into a uh, history and theory debate on what exactly political ecology means, but for many of these uh, ecopolians in, in Paris and Atecopol in Toulouse and, and, and Marseille and elsewhere, it just means that people from all kinds of disciplines say, well, we are a little bit sick with what we've been doing. We think it doesn't actually help anything. We want to do something different and we want to do something that uh, solves the uh, sustainability problem. And, uh, and we don't come with big projects, we don't come with money, we just come with ourselves and with our ideas and our knowledge and we bring it to the table and we talk about that. And I can only invite you in the Paris uh, uh, environment when you see announcements for events uh, done by, by Ecopolien. Some of you may already be familiar with that. I think these are fascinating moments because you, you, s you meet a lot of smart people who are actually questioning themselves. <coughs> Um, another thing is, of course, uh, information, information, information uh, to the general public. The Fête de la Science was just, um, uh, I think it's over now, but it was a, uh, a huge effort by uh, many, many scientists to inform the general public on various aspects of sustainability. Um, <coughs> and then uh, an, a third area which, in, again, would merit in itself uh, uh, a lot of attention is how do we transform ourselves? How do we transform our work as scientists and, and uh, including uh, teaching scientists so that it has the lowest possible environmental footprint? <coughs> it goes in France under the label Labo 1.5, um, which is kind of a statement, but really if you look at what Labo 1.5 does, goes far beyond reducing the carbon footprint of, of, of our work. I think it's, it's, it's really exciting. And then there is the, uh, the, the other activities to talk directly to decision makers and policy makers. There's some opening at the moment, but it's also a big struggle. You, you've heard perhaps about it, Valérie masson de Motte, co-chair of Working Group on IPCC, was received by the uh, entire French government just after the vacation for two hours was talking to them. Um, this is uh, the local member of parliament, uh, uh, parliament in, in, in Marseille, um, <coughs> uh, André Davy and others talking to, to local stakeholders about cruise shipping there, uh, and, and scientists in the room basically informing about that. There's actually, and that's where, sorry if it sounds romantic, but I think we, have, uh, we should be very happy that we live in a democratic society with a lot of free speech. Uh, there's a lot of these opportunities uh, being um, uh, used and developed at the moment to exchange with de uh, decision makers at all sorts of levels. But there's also the need that some of us see for more direct action that goes beyond the friendly talking and the friendly explaining things, um, which may in, in involve uh, demonstrations or, or, uh, or, or th throwing tomato soup at paintings or, or, or other things. Now that's not a, uh, one that was done by scientists, but there's a, a growing group uh, internationally that's called Scientist Rebellion, uh, which are colleagues um, who actively block events or streets or do other things uh, to draw public attention to the sustainability issues. Now that goes beyond sustainability science, but, but um, it's something that more and more uh, colleagues are now considering a real necessity. And I think uh, it, um, it is uh, a decision by every single individual where to put yourself on the gradient from uh, increasing, Im improving your outreach to concrete action on the ground. But if you want to look at the totality of what scientists do and can do at the moment, then, then this is part of the overall image. And finally, um, if you ask for those who question the need for all of this, 
then I think this um, caricature kind of illustrates very well why it's worth doing. Sustainability is not just uh, about climate and, and, and CO2, even if we were in a complete error about uh, CO2 and, and greenhouse gases, which we are not, but even if we were, then virtually every single action that is being proposed to, to mitigate is actually going to have um, uh, uh, positive consequences also on our lives in, in, in other ways. And uh, that is for me the, the one part of the motivation to, to speak about this and to, to try and encourage more sustainability science. Thank you very much. <laughs> I do have a question regarding energy independence. Which, which? I do have a question regarding energy independence. Yes. <coughs> because the way I see it is that climate change is, is a very massive issue and requires really a global solution. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, energy independence is more of a localized solution. And it's, it brings people back to their own city instead of us trying to build a global network of energy that will be more efficient to power the entire planet because some some regions uh, have more resources yes. in energy than other regions. Yes, but also we see that um, it's the, um, the fossil fuel dependency that we have created that, that uh, is actually stabilizing unsustainable policies. So in other words, um, we, do, we do need partnerships. You know, there are some, as you say, there are some, some regions that have better access to energy than others. Um, for example, even to renewables, it's clear that, that there will be, have to be global and, and, and regional exchange. But the degree to which we have made ourselves dependent on fossil energies, and that, by the way, includes uranium, uh, never forget about that. It's not just it's not just oil and gas and coal, but it's also uranium. Uh, the degree to which we have allowed a system to emerge that uh, that the dependency on these resources is very high. Uh, that that can never be sustainable. I mean that has that uh, yeah, there's lots to, there's lots to say about that. But I'm, I agree with you that energy independence is is. Um, I think that's what you're suggesting is, is, is a key factor of sustainability. That also goes, by the way, on regional and continental scales. Um, that's one of the difference between renewables and, uh, and big uh, fossil or nuclear infrastructure is that renewable energies can, can be managed at a much more localized scale, you know, in, in, up to the point even that it's in your own village or in your own roof where you, where you can have much of the energy and you're not depending on, on far away um, resources. I would like just to say one word. When we add the audition, we create this promotion. I mean, we just had one question in eight minutes because there are too many candidates. Mm. And we ask, what is the main social ecological problem you see? And how would you solve it? And most of the answers were turned towards uh, mobility issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like 90% of the answers were mm -hmm. in this direction. And so, uh, uh, we are like to, to, to note this, uh, yeah. this course and so we have turned every note towards inequality issues, adaptation and inequality, mitigation and inequality, energy mm -hmm. and inequalities. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I would like to uh, hear your thoughts about how you see, because you, you can see the problem as a global problem. Mm -hmm. But you can see also the problem as many ecologist thinkers have been thinking about it since the 70s as an, an inequality problem. Mm. Meaning that some people do profit from the works 
of others mm. just exploited and mm. that's how we arrive mm. at this very unsustainable situation. Mm. So just to explain. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, yeah. I'd <coughs> I'm perhaps not the best um, world expert on equity issues, but what I want to first say is that the sixth assessment report of the IPCC, the one from this year, has become much stronger on equity issues and climate justice particularly uh, than previous reports. And that is partly because the selection of authors involved many more human geographers and anthropo anthropologists and economists interested in, equ uh, in equity issues. So if you, if you look for those topics in the IPC report, you find much, much more and better information, including more qualitative information, because some of, some of these things are not easily quantified, but they're very important in, in, in qualitative statements. That's the first thing to say. And the other one that I feel strongly for is that the North-South equity issue is always on the table. We are not addressing it properly, yes. But we are often forgetting about the uh, equity issues within every single uh, region and society. And uh, if, if I look at it, for example, from uh, just as an example, the city of Marseille, uh, where I, I live on the outskirts of it, it's very clear that a, a significant portion of the population in Marseille are much more vulnerable to climate change than the other. Uh, part of the population. Because, and, and actually, uh, much of adaptation to climate change in Marseille is going to aggravate this because more and more people are going to install air conditioning systems, which, make, uh, which gives them decent temperatures even during the tropical nights in, in, in summer, but which heat the rest of the city and uh, which, which make life even worse for everyone who else doesn't have access to the technology. So, so the equity uh, or, um, or the, the, yeah, yeah, the equity issue, the climate justice issue, it exists on all scales. It exists within your local uh, community as much as on the, on the scale of the planet. And um, it's clear that there is no sustainability without uh, significantly addressing these equity issues. Do you have other questions? said that sustainability science science comes without a theory or a philosophy, uh, but um, it obviously does. Um, like it's based on a lot of Western things. The economics does the same thing. It says that its policies are based on something completely neutral, when in reality it really ignores a lot of perspectives that come from the global south specifically. And so here as well uh, with sustainability science, like um, um, how would that not happen? Like. Um, isn't it better to say that there is some theory and then um, go from there? Uh, to establish some theory and, and insist on that theory, is that what you're suggesting? Not insist on it, mm. but to just at least say that it's not a neutral position yeah. um, at all. Yeah. Well, that's perhaps a discussion to be had. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want to pretend that I have a, a fu to, um, fully satisfactory answer. But my my, the position that I'm taking personally at the moment is to say that since this is um, so complex, um, let's, let's allow for multiple ways of approaching it with only one, the only w one thing that I'm, I'm, I want to insist on is sustainable livelihoods for every person on earth. Um, how we get there, what do we need to address in our research projects where is the first um, uh, and most important social tipping point? Maybe, maybe your question relates a little bit to that diagram also. Um, that, that depends on, on many circumstances and there's no, there's no single answer to that. But, but I'm, what worries me always is when the discussion drifts away into some kind of theoretical and conceptual um, context without actually delivering results for the people. And, and, and that's, that's why I say it's more important that we, that we make progress uh, towards, uh, towards better livelihoods for everyone than that we have a, a, a fully um, developed philosophical and sociological 
uh, framing of, of, of all that. But I, I also recognize that that's a little bit because I come from the natural scientists, uh, sciences and I haven't actually read enough philosophy and, and, and Bruno Latour and, 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 and other, other people um, to, to, to give a more intelligent answer about that. <laughs> Mm. You mentioned that that's your uh, specialty. So, what are some of the like, most important practices of sustainability in the region? Yes, that's a very good question. The first thing that we noticed when we, um, some colleagues of mine and I, started to look at the available uh, information about the Mediterranean, we started in 2015 and we produced a report about that, is that the, um, um, the information itself is very uneven that we have a lot of information about the specific ports in the north and how sensitive they are to this wave height and to this kind of storm. And, and there are whole islands of Tunisia, for example, which are going to disappear um, uh, with a, just a few centimeters of sea level rise and nobody talks about it because there are no scientific papers. So the, the disequilibrium already in the information, let alone the issues themselves, but is, is huge. And, and we made a small effort to kind of scratch together all the, the little information we could find about the south and the east, but still it's a little bit like with the global map that I showed that one, sustainability, uh, one first level of sustain, uh, unsustainability is the fact that we know a lot about one part and we know very little about the other part. And the second is that, the, um, that the, uh, also like on the planet that the south is having uh, much greater vulnerabilities, also because of the climate, by the way, because water is generally more limited in the south and the east than it is in the north, uh, but also for all sorts of economic reasons, there are much less, there's much less capacity to, to, to adapt. Um, that's something that was kind of obvious, but we found a lot of, uh, lot of quantifications and, and, and data for that. And, uh, and perhaps the third is that uh, all of it, the entire Mediterranean, is facing the global issues. In other words, if we have sea level rise um, accelerate to the degree that we, uh, that we currently, uh, the, the report tells us about, then um, not only a lot of the history and the, and the cultural heritage of the Mediterranean is, is threatened. There are some very good papers about that, both in the north and in the south and the east but also a large, a large part of the agricultural productivity and particularly that of the um, most, uh, of the poorest populations. For, uh, and this particularly in the Nile Delta, um, where, where if you really the northern fringe of the Nile Delta, which is going to disappear, those are, those are poor farmers in, in Egypt. And, and, uh, and so again, th they, are, um, they are more at risk and more vulnerable than, than, than the rest of even the Egyptian population. That's, those are the kind of three main, um, main things that come to my mind in response to the question. But then I invite you to read the MEDEC report, um, which is medecc.org, um, which is our assessment report for the Mediterranean Basin. Yes? Yes. reports that kind of rank um, areas that might be prioritized in terms of uh, financial support that might have a global impact on lessening climate change. Like for example, this area hmm. should be focused on and let's put the finances there because it will have cumulative effects just as the ice cap. We can't save mm -hmm. ice, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. but there are mm -hmm. areas that we could mm -hmm. I don't know if I don't know. I'm not. I certainly don't have a perfect answer. But but what I want to say is that there's, a, as far as the climate goes, there's always the two sides of the coin. There's mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions, on the one hand, and there's adaptation to the unavoidable parts of climate change on the other. And both have costs, if you will. And but the 
the specific specificity about the mitigation, which mean which is really needed to be <coughs> increased as much as the adaptation, is that CO2 is a gas and greenhouse gases are, are gases that are getting around the globe within a few days. In other words, uh, we need to reduce emissions everywhere and there are no prioritized areas, um, except perhaps for the fact that uh, <coughs> where you can do it more easily, uh, you should do it first. And, and that depends on the technical situation. For example, if you, if you uh, uh, change the transport system in European uh, cities, then you should do that tomorrow because it gives you an immediate reduction and everybody is going to benefit from it. Uh, for adaptation, the issue of priority, priority areas is much more concrete because uh, the costs uh, arise at, at very local, in very local conditions. And, uh, and, and that's a whole area of uh, the loss and damage um, debate at the COP and, and there's a lot of economic uh, work about that because in part it is guided by still northern kind of indicators like uh, gross domestic product for example that they say ah oh, well if we if we protect this or that system then we have a good uh, reduction in of losses in terms of GDP but perhaps we have lots and lots of people who are actually uh, losing their livelihood so so there's um, in the way these priorities economic priorities for adaptation are being assessed you have to be very careful what the economic thinking and the societal thinking are, are behind this and very often in the past uh, in the end it looked like it would be economically more sensible to to protect northern systems just because they have high financial value but you actually protect perhaps fewer people than you do in the south thank you one last question hmm? nobody yeah. wants to ask this already okay um yeah after the speech now, so thank you for the speech. It was great. Um, kind of very happy and relieved that not a scientist actually was taking care of the FCC, so it's great. Um, yeah, it's a question that goes in the same way. Um, I didn't actually, I didn't see in your presentation if you put this this uh, information there, but what is the share of social scientists working in IPCC? Mm. And um, yes, so I'd like to know if you could comment on this. If there is some tension between, I would say, science and politics inside FCC, if you feel this, because, for example, um, I was trying to find, I was looking at the report now to see if I could find this, but, for example, when you address things like finance, um, and then you come to policy suggestions for this, for example, mm -hmm. um, in social science or in economics, um, we have different epistemologies, methodologies, yes? Cool. So, for example, for some, um, thinkers, finance is a big issue. For some others, maybe not such a big issue. <coughs> maybe inequality is a bigger mm -hmm. issue, and for others, maybe inequality not. Mm -hmm. And uh, if this discussion exists inside the IPCC, and uh, if it exists, um, if you, and if you know, uh, do you think like, uh, uh, who are the economists that are, or the social scientists that are winning these things inside there, or, mm. or is a fight on <coughs> I mean, I can only give a very short general answer because I'm, I'm, I was not part of this working group three where most of the economists are, uh, and I'm not an economist myself. And, and the, the impression I'm getting from my colleagues there is that there has also been a, a, a dramatic change in the type of economic thinking, in the, in the way of thinking about both finance and uh, indicators of... Uh, uh, economic success and uh, equity even from an economic point of view there has been a big change from earlier reports to this sixth assessment report but what you really should do and I'm, I don't have your your plan of speakers in this course on uh, in, 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 in my memory but I think you're going to get some some uh, some people who are more knowledgeable about that I think it's I think the glass is uh, rather half full than half empty in that sense I mean in earlier in earlier, IPCC um, processes, there was a very hard, I would say, neoliberal thinking, mm -hmm. um, and, and there's much less so. There's, for example, the recognition of the degrowth debate. There's not a degrowth scenario as such, but there's a recognition that the debate exists, and that's already quite a, quite a big step, um, but it's certainly not satisfactory. Yeah, and uh, so, but still, the problem is that we rely on the government's appointing us. Yes. 
Jessen decided to say to Vilna, yes. Um, Apparently, it was this the process. Yes, like the governments, they indicate some signs that they are. Not they do, they do, but um, that's why I insisted on so much, uh, so much on the fact that it's uh, also a debate between governments. You know, it's not just the the bad uh, Saudi government uh, insists on some kind of maximization of fossil fuels. They do, but they they meet uh, uh, they meet other governments in the same panel that are taking pretty much the opposite position <coughs> and then the debate and uh, the, the struggle is between those. <laughs> I think the next class is going to enter the room, right? Thank you, Jamie. No? <laughs> so I think we... Oh. No CO2 left in the room. Yeah, or oh, too, no, much, CO2, yeah, too yeah, much CO2, too much CO2. Too much CO2. So thank you everyone and uh, thank you, Bob Gong. Thank you, Natalie. <laughs>